Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Sharice Grimes. I'm an MPA student, and I'm the general manager of Maxwell Women's Caucus. Before we get started with our panel discussion, I'm going to give you a little overview of Maxwell Women's Caucus. We're an organization within the PIAI department focused on empowering women, not only in our program, but in the community as well. We empower through professional workshops, social events, and community activism. Some events that we've hosted thus far include a trip to Seneca Falls, in which we learned about women's history and how that applies to our lives. Hopefully some of us will be in that museum in the near future. <laughs> um, we hosted a, a week of events entitled 16 Days Against Violence, in which we inspired activism against violence against women throughout the world. We also host multiple potluck discussions with great food made by our delicious e-board members. <laughs> um, we've also hosted a Valentine's Day silent date auction in which we raised over $800, which we used towards sponsoring a networking event in Washington, D.C., in which we were able to network with multiple alumni from the Maxwell School. And today, we're sponsoring and we're helping to host a discussion with multiple panelists who have graduated from Maxwell. And I'm going to introduce our moderator, who is Jennifer Daly, and she serves as the community service chair for our organization. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Therese. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special event. Um, we are very lucky to have three impressive panelists here with us today. Um, firstly, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on each of our panelists. Um, to my immediate left is Flavia Rede Castro. She is from Arequipa, Peru. Um, she is currently the Youth Development Director at the YWCA of Syracuse and Onondaga County, where she oversees programming for Girls Incorporated. Flavia has experience working in international agriculture and rural development. She received her master's in geography, as well as her master's in public administration from the Maxwell School in 2013. Um, next to Flavia is Catherine Vanderveen. Catherine is a senior policy advisor on gender integration with the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department. Catherine has experience in gender integration and information access at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, as well as experience working on post-conflict reconstruction in North Africa and the Middle East. She was also at international, worked in international relief response with the American Red Cross. Catherine received her master's in international relations and public administration from the Maxwell School in 2012. Uh, and lastly, we have Anne Wadsworth and is the founder and executive director of the Girls Education Collaborative. She also serves on the board of the Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper, which is an environmental advocacy group, and was the executive director of the Kakenya Girls School in Kenya, and also the campaign director for the Alice Chrysan for Congress um, in 2008 and earned her executive master's in public administration from the Maxwell School in 2009. So that is just a brief bi biography of all of our panelists. Um, we will be asking some prepared questions, firstly, and then we will open it up to the audience for a question and answer session more towards the end. So let's get started. Um, our first question is, as women working in um, gender issues, both internationally and domestically, um, we would love to hear a little bit more about your career path up to this point. Um, please feel free to mention any aspects of your life that have particularly inspired you towards working on gender equality. OK, I'll start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. I really miss this place, I should say. <laughs> um, so, as Jen said, I was born in Peru. 
So my thing has always been social justice. Uh, coming from Peru, I guess one is exposed to these really stark differences between the haves and the have-nots. And um, so I would say that, you know, then coming to the U.S., um, my vision shifted a little bit. Um, just looking at my own society as an outsider's perspective um, allowed me to look critically at, you know, what I was living uh, back in Peru. So uh, once I came to Maxwell and I joined the geography department, then really I learned to think critically about the ways in which I saw my life and which I lived my life and things that I considered normal when I was back in Peru. Um, and, you know, thinking about social justice, about gender equality, and all these things that happen. Um, but then, being an immigrant here, I was more tied to the struggles that one has trying to fit into a different society. So I joined a nonprofit organization as a volunteer, Hopeprint. Uh, it's a startup. They started maybe three years ago. And their mission is to um, sort of like creating a closer link between the Syracuse community and the refugee community. And uh, I ended up working with Girl Scouts. And so being a volunteer for a Girl Scout troop with all these little refugee girls has truly been, or is still being, an amazing experience for me. Now with that experience, um, I would say let me backtrack a little bit because I came from a privileged background in Peru. So I used to be one that would laugh and really mock my friends that were like, you know, like, oh, feminist power or whatever. So now, you know, being involved in all of this, I really see the value. I really see the difference and the struggles. And um, today I work for the YWCA and for Girls Inc. And being a part of Girls Inc., I would say that I am really, really proud. It's an amazing organization. I have been able to network and meet people that are very qualified, very passionate. And, um, and I am really able to see how programs like the one in which I work have an impact on the lives of girls. And I would say that before, gender equality wasn't my thing, but today it is. And I am very happy and very proud to say that. So, thank you. Fantastic. Well, um, I will second the fact that it's an honor and a pleasure to be back here at Maxwell talking um, both at an event um, from the Maxwell Women's Caucus, but the department more generally um, to kind of have a chance to talk about women's issues and gender equality broadly. Um, I think my story is, is similar in some aspects in that um, I really always looked, was very intrigued by how different cultures, looking at the similarities and differences and how different cultures tell stories um, or interpret events um, and how their structures are built in certain ways, which always put me then on a path of looking beyond my borders towards a career that would be in something that was focused on working with whether it was first started with students who, um, you know, at my university undergrad, working with students who were coming from abroad, helping them um, orient to the U.S., um, or then working on issues of international development, which then led to an interest um, in coming here to Maxwell and moving on beyond that. Um, I think for me, that was paired with um, an upbringing by two really phenomenally strong women, my mother and my grandmother, who focused on, in their own way, not explicitly on gender equality um, and what um, the strength um, that women can uh, bring. And when I started then, you know, I, so I had that as a backbone and a personal um, strength to rely on. When I started working with more cultures and, and seeing more um, issues of inequality for women and girls around the world, that was when I kind of then stepped took the strength that I had seen, you know, issues that my mother or my grandmother had overcome and said, okay, I want to make sure that the strength that I had been given as their gift to me, that I could then help um, bring that to women and girls around the world. So that's how I've ended up doing what I do. 
Okay, thank you, Jennifer. It's, uh, I'm so happy to be here as well, and especially meeting Catherine and Flavia for the first time. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I think my journey is a little different, as, but some similarities. I was not in a gender space uh, previously either. And I did the uh, raising kids and the on-ramp and the off-ramp for a number of years, but I was involved in educational advocacy, communications, politics. Uh, I had done some international work when I was younger, and I, I think that, f that influence and that footprint was always there, some early service work. And I deliberately came to Maxwell to think about, to take some space and think about what was going to be next in my life, and, and uh, knew that it might be an opportunity for a, a pivot if I so wished to pivot. And two things happened while I was here. Um, one was that I loved so much working with my colleagues from around the world that I definitely, I decided that I wanted to get back into a global space. I had lived in Kenya for a year when I was younger and had worked in South America and I, I, and I loved it. So that was decision number one. And then decision number two came when um, I picked up the course catalog one day and saw this course called Girls' Education in Developing Countries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was, this was pre-buzz. Like, nobody was really talking about this yet. And so I, this is true confession time. I read that course title, and I said, why would anybody take a whole course on girls' education in developing countries? Uh, it obviously did not take very long to find out. And... It was very transformative for me because when I learned, when I dove into this and learned about the barriers between girls and their education and how wide and broad and deep they are, and you know, just these formidable barriers and repeated all around our world, and on its own as a human rights issue was sort of had me at hello type of thing. But then when you added on to it, the effect on the greater community. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, when, when I learned about this, I couldn't turn away. And uh, so it was a very defining uh, course for me. And by the time I wrapped up my program at Maxwell, I had decided that I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but it was going to be something around girls' education in um, impoverished communities around the world. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question, this is kind of a, a fun question for you all. You get to think creatively. Um, the second wave of Millennium Development Goals is currently being created, and it's time to reevaluate the global progress on gender equality. Um, if you were responsible for creating the ideal Millennium Development Goals, um, what would you highlight as a priority for women and girls? Anyone can start. Um, like sure, I'll jump in. Sure. You know, it's, it's interesting because they were just talking quite a bit about this last week in New York at the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, what is going to be the post-2015 agenda. And on the opening day, uh, a few organizations held a side panel. Uh, UNGEI was there, and a minister from Australia, and it, it was a great discussion. And I loved it, and it was something that I just want everybody to hear because they just kept coming back to that if we don't put a spotlight on educating girls, that everything else we try to do is going to be very compromised and that the focus should be on educating girls. And we, um, and, and, you know, and, and in a very uh, high quality, uh, meaningful, sustainable way. So uh, I, that was a, a, a real spotlight on that the data that's coming in is so powerful and that we really have not been investing uh, the resources that we need to be investing in it. So that being said, with girls' education at the core of it, it's also, just as we do our programming, really important to address those critically interrelated issues, which are going to be health, agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, vocational training, leadership, and, and disease prevention, and, and, and such. Thank you. So for me, I, I 
definitely agree with you. But one thing that I would like to emphasize is uh, voice. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, voice is really big. And when I say voice, I'm thinking about women in the workforce and especially in the government. Because it's very important to have more women having these really important conversations like what we're having right now uh, so that you know we can get these changes to happen. So I would say that for me it's definitely voice hmm. and women in government. I think that's, that's fascinating because you know, if you go back to 1995 and you go back to the original Beijing Declaration, those two pieces are in there. Um, and we've seen it, you know, the global agenda on women's rights kind of narrowing down um, and they've picked out now there's voice as like an overarching theme, not just for, you know, women's um, ability to work in government, but also ability to advocate um, also in the business sphere. What does it mean to have uh, voice and agency? Um, I think education is one of the critical points that we need to address globally for boys and girls um, in terms of being then better prepared um, to open up whether you want um, a career in government, whether you want a career in business, however you want to spend your life, that you have the opportunity that you've been given to really then take the tools and, and choose what you want to do and have that as, as an opportunity. What I would say that I see that I think undermines so much um, of either our work in education, our work in enabling women to choose whatever lifestyle or, or life choice or business choice that they want to pursue is the issue of violence against women and girls. Um, from birth onwards, seeing discrimination um, from you know, uh, sex selection during pregnancy to seeing um, FGMC uh, uh, practiced against girls to seeing early enforced marriage practice, that all of those pieces are part of what is holding us back from making sure that girls are getting the same educational opportunities and later on that they can have the space and the voice and agency to be part, fully participating in, in their communities and their countries. So. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about globalization. Um, in an increasingly globalized world, what reforms do you think are necessary for women and girls to capitalize on the global economy? Um, how can we make it more accessible for women and girls? Also, how do you think um, women and girls can properly navigate the dangers and drawbacks of globalization? So, <laughs> I would say, I I'm going to answer thinking about the context in which I work, and this is uh, girls in inner cities here in the States. And one thing that I would definitely say is that, um, that is how do you prepare also, how do you prepare the girl for globalization? Hmm. I, I'm thinking about a lot of self-esteem, a, a lot of the girl thinking about how she, or helping the girl realize how she fits in her community, but also how she fits in her global community. Uh, and there are many things that tie in here, because education is a big one, mm -hmm. because girls need to be better informed about uh, other communities and you know what's happening elsewhere. Um, so, yeah. No, I, I, I would say that the, the thread there is access to information for everyone equally from a young age, whether it's through education, whether it's through community centers, um, libraries are a great resource. However it is in that community that um, the girl is living within, that we're making sure that she has equal access to information, not only um, about herself, her own body, but also um, girls living around the world and what the opportunities are out there. I think, you know, if you had asked me when I was a girl living in the States, living you know a very nice, comfortable life, if I had any idea of what the life was like of a girl in India or Kenya or wherever, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, now, that dates me because that was pre-internet time and I couldn't just Wikipedia <laughs> anything. But I think you know as now we see those windows of opportunity through technology opening up, it's making sure that girls in this country and other countries have 
um, the ability to see what paths and opportunities are out there, and then at the same time being paired with the legal rights and resources that they can then take those on it and actually pursue them. Yeah, this well, this is an interesting question for me, and taking it again within the context, because, um, well, especially this one community where we're working, in a sense, like globalization is such a far th thought. I mean, we're working mm -hmm. on survival. Mm -hmm. It, you know, globe, the thought of being prepared for globalization is, is just really down here. We're trying to keep these girls, in a sense, alive right now and, and becoming literate. Um, and dis, uh, the development of them understanding that they have you know, human rights and can maybe have some control over their, over their lives. Uh, but, I, I, but things move really rapidly. And I think it's very complex, and you get the, um, when we open up, when we turn on that valve to this greater world, um, you know, suddenly, I mean, who knows how long it's going to be before there are smartphones in a lot of these communities and, mm -hmm. and access to the same kind of information that we have. And, and I, you know, I think about what are the unintended consequences of that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things with globalization that I think warrant a lot of thoughtfulness that do we want to keep, you know, are there certain trends that we can keep going? You know, um, materialism and, and how that affects our planet and, you know, what are, the, um, what are the feedback loops and how does it end up helping or harming communities, I mean, including, including our own. So I think in some of the communities I, I'm working, as I say, working in right now, access to globalization still seems like it's light years away, but with the way our world right, works right now, it may not be. And I, I'm not really sure, you know, under that, sort of under that frame, how one really does um, responsibly help prepare um, somebody. I mean, liter for me, literacy, financial literacy, huge tools. Mm -hmm. I think understanding the concept of human rights, I mean, huge tools. Those are, those are kind of fu fundamentals. But I think it starts getting really complex. And if I may add something, um, I, I think that it's, it's very important, you know, for a girl to start thinking about how she's going to, you know, develop to a woman, into a woman that's going to then, you know, I guess, I don't know how you phrase the question, benefit from the global economy, is that I feel like self-esteem is so big. Mm -hmm. It's so important because you will only do as much as you think you're capable of doing. And so I think it is in immensely important to have a mentor, you know, someone that will help you achieve or believe that you can achieve as much as you can. So, yeah. Good piece to add. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to take sort of a, a policy shift here. We're going to talk about um, how the news portrays policies for women. Um, we have seen that a lot of times policies that are geared towards women are often marketed as good for everyone. Um, for example, reporting the benefits of equal pay for equal work usually talks about how this will stimulate the economy. Um, have you found that shaping the effects of a policy towards the population as a whole is more effective than simply mentioning how a policy will affect women only? Take that first. <laughs> Are you guys Anyone? both looking at me? Okay. Jump in. Okay, I'll jump. Um, I think I think there's value in it that it brings more people to the table. And so it'll it'll start off engaging more people in the conversation. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. You're going to get people paying attention who, if it was just a women's issue, are not going to pay attention to it. So for example, in the communities where I work, I mean, this is very much 
being used right now as to why to educate a girl. Uh, often it's not talked about in the frame of their individual human rights, but it's framed in that it, it, the benefits to the community as a whole and that this is what might break down poverty, et cetera. So, um, but once somebody's at the table and listening, I think there's the opportunity for the prog progression of thinking while people learn more, and so they may, with further understanding, end up a pl at a place that on its own is a human rights issue, is that that's a standalone issue as well, but they may not start thinking with that. So I, I think if you have an opportunity to bring more to people to the table and help them understand, I don't see anything wrong with that. I also think that, um, well, for me, if it brings in more funding, <laughs> I'm all about it. <laughs> I mean, you know, we have to be pragmatic here. But um, I also think that it is part of the story mm -hmm. and that it's, um, you know, it's the data, that information also, it, it, it just is part of the story. And it just might be that we're in a situation, one of the rare cases where you can have your cake and eat it too type of thing because it's such a win, because it's such a win-win. So I don't know how your experiences are with it. I, I, um, so I think, you know, the, the nugget that I'm pulling there is, you know, a lot of the time it's that it's, um, you know, who's in conflict resolution, who's done park stuff here. It's the framing of how you're presenting the issue. It's how you're pulling in some of the, um, disparate players that ne you need to make uh, a r to have around the table to make a difference in, in gender issues who don't necessarily want to see it labeled as women's issues or feel uncomfortable for whatever it, uh, the primary reason is within that society or structure that that we're talking about you know something that like for example violence against women extremely uncomfortable topic but if I can bring it together by talking about the economic benefits of uh, addressing um, domestic violence, then okay, then I can have a conversation with more interested people and, and get them to the table. Um, now, is that an ideal situation? No, because I'm not, I'm, I'm hiding behind this layer of, um, this, this other layer than really head on making sure that I can address the issues that I want to address. But, Again, it's a conflict resolution technique. If I'm going to be able to talk to people who are in, are in power, who I need to have on my side to make a difference, I'm going to use it. So, I don't know. Do you see that in your communities that you're working? I mean, what I think, and I didn't take the class with Professor Vance like, or any classes with policy, so this is all pure judgment, and it might sound. Uh, illogical, but I think that, of course, everything is interconnected. So, yes, of course, you know, like, highlighting women's issues is very important, but also, I mean, for, I guess, the marketing aspect, you know, like, you also have to highlight how it's all interconnected, mm -hmm. you know, how, um, by doing equal pay, how you're going to benefit the families where the husbands are losing their jobs because originally they had a higher pay rate. Or, you know, the single mothers that then, you know, you're gonna reduce poverty. So I think, I think it is really important to emphasize how, you know, everything, all of these, I don't know, components that are affected by the policies um, contribute to, I guess, making a change, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, and I think yes. it's that um, that's, there's the feedback loop, too. So, mm -hmm. right, so uh, strengthening the girl who becomes the woman strengthens her whole community. Mm -hmm. But then that stronger community comes back and helps that woman lead a more complete life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sort of goes in and out on mm -hmm. itself, which is which is another way to, um, another good reason to support what the ripple effects are, because the ripples end up coming back in to help that, to help the individual woman yeah. as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, great, okay. Um, our next question is about staying motivated in a 
often um, environment that has the potential to be very negative. So oftentimes women's and girls' rights are surrounded by very depressing news stories. For example, um, the Steubenville, Ohio rape trial or um, the shooting of Malala in Pakistan, things that are very heavy and very depressing. Um, how do you, as women that work on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, um, stay motivated and positive in an environment that can sometimes be very negative and often frustrating? I would say, in my case, that it's going to sound strange, but I find this, all of those depressing news, incredibly motivating because um, we're all here because we care. We're all here because we want to serve and we want to make someone else's life better. And so I feel like the more impact, you know, there's more potential for impact, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I would say. More impact. Yeah. Yeah. More work to do. Yeah. Plenty of work to do. It was interesting because, so, um, we got these questions just a couple days ago, and for the past week I've been working on, or a story that's been in my periphery um, at work has been, um, I was privileged to meet um, one of the uh, State Department's International Women of Courage, who is um, Lakshmi from India, who is an acid attack survivor who's making a great difference in India, working with the Supreme Court to make sure that the sale and regulation of acid is actually regulated and so that it's more difficult to buy and that's that people cannot use it as a weapon against girls and women. And uh, I was with her in Chicago as, as these women were wrapping up their um, time here in the States after um, they were at the State Department. And we were having a discussion and she said, I'm sorry, I just can't focus because there was this attack in Lucknow and I feel guilty that I'm here in the States and I'm not in India where I could be drawing attention. And um, the attack was absolutely horrific. This woman who was seven months pregnant was held down by her in-laws over a dowry dispute. Um, both, we learned, forced to drink acid and had acid poured over her body. Um, and so, yes, the news stories are motivating. <laughs> but there are times, I think, to your, your, the root of the question, there are times when you get issues like that and, you know, we grow a thicker skin, but it is um, definitely an area where you need to learn, one, how am I going to protect myself and, and be able to respond and stay um, motivated and positive in this situation. And um, that was a particularly difficult um, uh, story to be involved with. Um, so I was laughing when I read the question because, you know, I, with some of my colleagues, you know, we, we have this discussion of, like, how do we support each other um, in, in doing the work that we do? And, you know, one of them answered, well, you know, I go running. If I didn't go running every day, I would go crazy. Um, another one was like, well, I meditate every day. And I'm like, you both sound much more healthy because my answer is a glass of wine and a you know Netflix <laughs> queue of Grey's Anatomy episodes, so I can just cry it all out. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know the important lesson there is that um, you know you are part. It, it, find what it is that is going to remind you that you are making a difference, but also. Um, have something that helps balance you, whether it's a group of friends, whether it's an activity, something that, that puts a little bit back into your soul when, so that you are strong enough to, to be engaging outwards. Uh, gosh, I, I, the, what I'd want to add to the global stories is to sometimes that um, what we do is just in the, these remote areas and, you know, helping make things happen and things that the community wants, it still gets um, difficult at times. Sometimes it can just be really messy and hard work and a little discouraging. So I just you know, have had the privilege of meeting a lot of girls and th that they are girls who are so excited at the thought of an education. Just the way they 
they just glow even just thinking about maybe someday having an education or if you meet the girls who have the opportunity to be in school. And they are such role models and they are so inspiring and have such worth ethics and have such dreams and visions that I, I just draw on those girls I've met time and time again. And I just like keep them laser-like in my focus and I try to get the other noise to go away and um, say, okay, despite the world's shortcomings or our shortcomings or somebody else's shortcomings, these girls deserve what we're, what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, we'll find a way to get it, and we'll find a way to get it done. So they, um, they're my, what, are, what is that, what are they called, a muse? Mm -hmm. Like if you're, is that appropriate to call them, a, no, they maybe not. They inspire you. Those who inspire you? I don't know if it's a good analogy, mm -hmm. but no, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think it's time to open up the questions to the audience. I'm sure you all have a lot of burning questions that you've been waiting for me to stop asking so that you could start asking. Um, so I think they're coming around with microphones and prepare your, your questions for our panelists. Hi, my name is Bree. I'm a senior here, International Relations, Middle Eastern Studies major. Um, I interned last semester in DC for Vital Voices, where we talked a lot about Kikenia, actually. Um, and a big discussion we had at Vital Voices with um, partnering with these women abroad and helping promote this education was the notion and the argument of the Western woman trying to save this you know, save the brown woman, essentially, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and so I wanted to know what your opinion on that was. We've had a lot of debates and discussions about it within Vital Voices and among all of my friends. Um, and just trying to reconcile with, the, with that balance of, you know, are we helping or are we hurting coming from the West? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in for that first. Uh, that's a great question. And we thought a lot about that. We're only a two-year-old NGO, so that was a very big question to us as we got together. And what it led to is that really at the core of our mission, if you read our mission statement, that our mission is to support community-led initiatives. So the way we've approached it is that, um, that there's value in us being, um, think of us as a portal mm -hmm. to resources. And those resources can sometimes be, it can be money, it can be pure money when pure money is needed, but it can also be resources, I mean, you know, access to expertise, um, malaria prevention programs or teacher training or things that the community have identified would bring value to what they're doing, but they don't have access to it like we do. So in building partnerships or you know, bringing things that we can help access all these resources and bring them to a community-led project. So it's, um, it's not always the easiest thing in the world, having a partner versus it being your project, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a really important piece of it. Uh, and I think it's great, that question is, is getting asked more and more and I think I'm more familiar um, with Africa than some other countries. And you, I love seeing what the, the youth, a lot of the youth leadership is doing to coming and taking ownership of that. And I think that's certainly an end game, isn't it? Um, so that's one approach that we've taken. And we do try to be very sensitive about that. Um, so I think that goes to addressing maybe what you were, what you were asking. I think it's an incredibly <laughs> complicated question. Uh, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that because of, I mean, mostly because of my personal, you know, like my background, having come from Peru and having, um, you know, a lot of this, seeing a lot of these dynamics in, in my country. But then that speaks a lot to, um, you know, the rights and wrongs and how these are, um, relative, right? And they're depending on the culture that you come from. 
but then that also speaks to how do you see a culture if it's mm -hmm. if a culture is something that's going to remain static or if it's something that continuously change changes um, so I mean I you know like there's no black and white so I would say you know like it's in some cases it's good but you know you have to draw a line at some point I feel um, to where it's, it's very important to have that voice again the voice from the local leaders or the local women the, the communities uh, to where these changes reflect to what you know not what the powerful nations want but really what where they want to head yeah. so and I think this is something, you know, back to globalization. I do think there is a shift in, in um, more awareness that these are questions that we need to be always cognizant of. Um, and, par you know, whether you model it through partnership, whether it is making sure that you are connected to equal voices on the ground, both male and female, or whatever gender it is that in the issue that you are tackling. Um, I think, you know, whether it's globalization that's really sparked that shift in conversation or a generational shift as we have more young leaders who are um, both in this country and in other countries around the world who are trying to, to come at it from that angle. I do think that people are, are being more cognizant that there is more than one solution, um, clearly, for any um, given, whether you call it cultural community or country. So. Hi, my name is Nicole. I'm a current MPA student here at Maxwell. Um, and my question, I guess, at first I thought it was more about domestic policy and issues here, but to be honest, I guess it can go abroad. But in the wake of things like uh, President Obama's um, My Brother's Keeper initiative and things like that, where you're specifically, or he and the government is specifically um, working and targeting one population or one specific group of people, do you feel that the same type of commitment has been going or has gone to women's or young women's issues? And I said at first I thought it was just domestically, but thinking about how much money the U.S. gives abroad and to other countries, do you think that there's been that type of commitment to young women across the world both at, within that same type of idea of targeting them and their issues specifically? Well, the easy answer is no. <laughs> oh. What, you think there has been enough? No. Mm. Oh, so I'm going to put on my State Department hat for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have a little battle here. Um, so I, I will say um, that from a policy perspective, from an international policy perspective, yes, there is a strong focus on the rights of women and girls globally as a national security and foreign policy priority. So there have been a number of... Um, both strategies and policies um, written into our national security strategy, into strategies that work. Um, for example, we have now a United States strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. We have a strategy on um, working to make sure that women are equal participants in peace and security and post-conflict reconstruction issues. Those are all pieces that I've seen um, evolve over the past few years that have really kind of shine a spotlight, but I'm now curious what the other side is. Mm. <laughs> well, I would not necessarily debate that, Okay. but strategies don't always lead to action. Yes. And so is there the follow through with the commitment of resources to see those strategies make impact? You want me to keep going? Keep going. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think yes. Um, I think we have seen um, commitment to seeing it um, followed through. I think that that's where then we need MPA students um, and IR students who are ready and willing to take on the challenge of how do you move from strategy to implementation, both from a government perspective, but then also partnering with NGOs, partnering with the private sector, partnering with communities around the world to make sure that then, okay, we've spent this time thinking through what does it mean, what are the best practices that we can be working on, and then now how do we go out and implement them. So my question is, um, it was mostly related to um, how do you, how do each of you feel about initiatives to 
kind of educate men to respect women and to empower them and to respect their human rights? And if so, what components of, of this would you specifically support? Any questions? Do you want to start, Flavia? No. <laughs> <laughs> no? I need to think. OK. <laughs> So your question was about <laughs> investing in educating and helping men understand yes. women's human rights issues. And can I extend that, that you sure. would include boys yes. as part of that? Yeah, I think it's hugely important. It's hugely. And, and um, even when I talk about investing in girls' education, I would never want to, um, we need to invest in boys' education as well. I mean, they're huge quality issues, well, here and abroad, right, with quality, a meaningful, relevant, high-quality education. Uh, when you're an organization, and, and again, this is where I think in the trending towards partnerships and organizations supporting each other, um, sometimes you've got to ch pick your battle and zoom in on it, but it doesn't mean that you uh, don't value or you can try to partner with somebody else and, and then they complement, the efforts complement. Um, I th so I think, it's huge, I think it's hugely important. And I think there's been some really good, I'm not totally up to speed with this, it's not, I wouldn't say it's my area of expertise, but what I've read that there have you know, been some really successful mm -hmm. programmings and I think there's some really good models out there um, working with, with boys and, and men. Also, but, as a sub-question, do you think that these efforts can be adapted to, uh, to like, a globalized format? Yes. Yeah, well, and I'm talking about s um, some studies I've read about global, yeah. with global efforts, yeah. But yeah. you might know more about it than I do. No, I think there is a huge understanding that in order to get to the root of gender inequality, which is, you know, comes to us from generations of patriarchal societies, we need to engage with men and boys and have discussions around what it means to have equality between men, women, or whatever gender we want to then extrapolate towards. Um, I think that there are lots of um, good stories coming out, especially in the, um, in, in the GBV arena about successful programs to engage men and boys around gender-based violence. Um, and I think I, I have seen those then replicated from country to country and people having the conversations, how do I take it here, how do I take it there, so. I would say that, you know, generalizing the efforts and, you know, like I would do that to a certain extent because the way in which, uh, I don't know, like this macho cultures, I guess, at some mm -hmm. point look like or what women are supposed to be or, um, it's just it's just different, varying from country to country, I would say, or culture to culture. I don't know if you guys saw, there was a really interesting article on NPR sometime last week that was comparing women in the Middle East versus mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. in South America, in yeah. Brazil, and, uh, and how, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess how the role of women is so different, or, you know, like the... The, is it a word, demonization or like the lessening? I'm, I'm just, this is my Spanish right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it in Spanish? Subordination, yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, so the subordination of women, you know, it's it just completely different, but it's, it's just very real and, you know, and so what they were saying, for instance, is like Brazil is seen like as a very liberal, progressive country, but then the subordination of women is like, you know, whereas yes, you know, it's, it's progressive to wear a bikini, but mm -hmm. how do you then, uh, this conception of the women's body, you know, like how, how is that, objects. yeah, how are we seen as objects versus in the Middle East, you know, like you wear more. Uh, and so that's frowned upon, but you know, like there are different ways in which this looks like, right? So I think the way in which this has to be addressed or how men have to be engaged in these conversations 
has to be different. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be in different ways. Hi, um, my name is Julia. I am also, as well as a group of us, in the girls education course this semester. <laughs> so this question is probably more specific to Anne, but of course, any ideas you guys have, please chime in. Um, you mentioned that when you work with communities, you try to have the project community-led, and what are some of the most successful strategies that you guys use to engage the communities, and also, how do you work with local governments at all? Um, so, I, can I check back with you in a couple of years? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're really, we're two years old. We're, we're kind of new out of the gate. And uh, so, honestly, we're finding our way with, with all of that. Um, we have two projects, one in Tanzania, one in Zambia. They look very different. Uh, and it's 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 a very and but but they are distinctly community led projects uh, and that we've we've come in at a at a phase also where things were already initiated so you know maybe down the line we're part of that initiation with the community as the community says well we want to do something but we're not sure what to do or how it looks at maybe we're part of that dialogue very early but to date, we've actually jumped in after there's already a vision statement, I would say. And trying to figure out how those relationships work and long distance and that you're good partners and understanding each other's um, needs uh, is, I, I would say, we're, it's, it's a process and that we're on a journey with it. So maybe if I get to come back again in a couple of years, I can add to it. But I'm not sure you ever have a really good answer. I think it's being really op open and honest and thoughtful and respectful are just the elements that you always have to keep in mind. And I think it's, a ch it's, it's nothing stays stagnant. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing I've learned. Actually, one of our internal values as an organization is to stay nimble and creative. Mm -hmm. And we are finding that in real life, we have to be very, very nimble and creative. If I may add something, that's something that I'm actually struggling with in my uh, job. Uh, so we work um, most, well, we work in my organization, there's a program that works with uh, women that have been incarcerated, bringing them back to society. On my end, I work with girls, um, from 5 to 18, and so part of part of uh, what I do, as I'm new to the job, I started in September, I'm quickly finding that it's very important to develop that relationship first. You know, for, for your programs to be sustainable, I guess, it's, it's very important to engage parents in that conversation, and that also depends, you know, on the the demographics or, you know, like those little strategies on what population you're aiming to target, right? The schools, the schools are key. So you have to develop that relationship with the schools. If you're dealing with teenagers, you know, like building that trust is also key. Um, and, you know, like other community organizations. So the, the main thing is, you know, like to make it a collaborative effort, I would say, for programs to be sustainable. That's from my experience. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm a joint MPA IR student. Um, and I apologize if you already touched on this. I had a meeting, so I was late. Um, but in, this addresses more of the policy makers and the composition of policy makers as it affects women's equality, both globally and locally. But in my experience, I've seen women hurt, not help other women, kind of rise to a position where they're making policy addressing these specific issues. And so my question is, from your experience, now that you've, you're in positions making policy, do you have suggestions to other women to kind of how to help other women not hurt them get into these positions? Does that make sense? 
Like, how can we help each other get to a position where we're the ones informing policy and making policy as opposed to seeing it as a, you know, zero-sum game. You're getting the job over me getting the job. I think that's got your name written all over it. Um, so this is a fascinating um, debate. Um, and, you know, it. Anne-Marie Slaughter's brought it up. Sheryl Sandberg's brought it up. How do we, as women help other women, um, and I think it goes, the, the under, for me, the underlying structural issue that we need to address is that there aren't enough equal opportunities for women in positions point blank that we need to be addressing. So, and, you know, part of that plays out as we see women competing with each other rather than trying to change the system around them. Um, I think that has to do with making, you know, whether you want to put your efforts behind equal pay, work-life balance initiatives. Um, I think moving all of those pieces will start helping get, um, and then, you know, teaching a culture of, of, of mentorship and, and women helping other women. I think if you move all three of those pieces, you'll have a better system for, for bringing more women up higher. You know, and one thing that I would say that a lot of it, I mean, I, I'm just speaking from the, you know, I don't know this in policy, but I, you know, like generalize, and I would say that a lot of it. I don't think it's just, it's not just policy. I mean, that's Yeah, it's, it's yeah. in anything, right? So that it, it really depends on what the organizational culture is. You know, like mm -hmm. one thing on, again, emphasizing girls think I've never seen I mean, I'm just in love with the organizational culture because as soon as you walk in in those rooms, I mean, it's all about like, you know, how are your programs working? How can I help you? I can send you like, you know, what I send for fundraising, even though all the affiliates or the local organizations are competing with each other, you know, with, uh, you know, like on larger foundations, there's this amazing sense of helping each other mm -hmm. because we all have the same mission. and. Uh, that's something that reflects very clearly. I, and I don't know how they did it. And I, I've been asking, how do you do it? Because in my local organization, you know, I feel like it's really important to build that culture of cooperation, of, you know, that motivation. And I, I feel like, you know, like, again, organizational culture is a big part of it. Because you adapt to what's already there. And you, you act or react to what you're seeing already try to fit in, I guess, if that makes sense. So. Good afternoon, ladies. I'm a senior IR major with a concentration in Asia. And I've recently developed a new passion, and that's for human sex trafficking. And it kind of came about after the Super Bowl. I had read this, I had already had like a background in it, because I had written a paper about it, so it was an interest of me. But then I read this fact that said that 12 million women and children were trafficked into New York City for the Super Bowl. And I felt that was extremely perverse, but then I had some questions. Because being that that's the number that was given, there's probably way more that are underreported. And there's also, so, but basically the question for you is, is that in your respective regions of um, concentration, how do these girls get trafficked and what are the individual nations and countries doing to prevent this? I know in some countries girls are pretty much given up just because they're females, so I'm pretty sure you could probably ask for the baby and they'll probably give it to you. But like, what's being done on a global standpoint to prevent this from happening, being that it is now a very, very big problem? So I think, unfortunately, I know I'm not a trafficking expert. Neither am I. I don't know if you've had any background in... No, I don't, but I can tell you, I mean, I know someone at the geography department was doing a PhD mm -hmm. looking at trafficking between North Korea and China. And, uh, you know, I would be more than happy to, you know, after the panel uh, finishes to show you, because downstairs is the library, the geography library, and I can show you and, you know, maybe you'll find some good sources there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in terms of sources, definitely um, I can point you in the direction of, of where the State Department and other agencies are working on addressing trafficking issues. I think what really struck me from the Super Bowl um, was that it was actually made 
national news here in the U.S. that this was an issue because we see it globally. It, this is not the first time that it's happened either around a Super Bowl or around, you know, whether it's the World Cup or war, the Olympics. It's something that I think now I was really surprised to see more attention drawn to the fact that sport major global gatherings and sports events in particular are uh, opportunities for people to really crack down on trafficking. So that was my little glimmer of hope <laughs> around that issue. So. Lavia, I have a question specifically for you. Bear with me, it's a little bit long. Um, you mentioned that one limitation to underprivileged girls in developing countries is low self-esteem or girls who view themselves in a limited capacity. And this is an issue that multiple girls in our country um, deal with as well, especially because there's two extreme views of womanhood. You have on one end um, Beyonce or Kerry Washington, and then on the other end you have a video girl, right? And a lot of girls don't see themselves as having the ability to reach Kerry Washington or Beyonce, but they know that they can get in a video and they know that they're beautiful and they know that they can make money in that way. So in what ways can we kind of break down that limited capacity here in the U.S. and start having women view themselves in a job that's not limited to either superstardom or super fame or the kind of over-sexualization? Uh, so I would say definitely, well, in my job here in the U.S. in Syracuse, that's something that I, that I do see very often and yesterday actually yesterday I was in a fundraiser in New York like I was telling them and in this fundraiser uh, a lot of girls were talking about how you know this touching on this issue of self-esteem and how they overcame the issues that they were facing and you know like of course not that it stops there but now how you know they raised their bar, and now how they're in uh, college. So I think that it's, first of all, it's, it's really important, again, emphasizing having a mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, having someone, a female role model, that will show you that you can, you can be as much as you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you set your own limits, but also, at Girls Inc., we have a curriculum that touches on media and that looks critically at media, how it affects, um, you know, if you look at a magazine of a woman in a bikini, you know, and then you look, you think, oh, that's how a woman should be like. You know, if I'm not there, I'm not a real woman or I'm, I'm less. And so I think it's really important to engage girls at a young age to start them, to make them learn to think critically, you know, at that young age, to think or to know that that's, you know, that's, it's all about money, but also that that's not, you know, how all of these things affect the way in which they see themselves and the, what they want to do with their lives. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, mentorship, like I said, is another big one. And um, hmm. I mean, I would say that this is, it's just so much. It covers so much. I mean, going from, from bullying, you know, like how do, how do you overcome that? Sisterhood, that's a big one. And you know, it's, it sounds a little bit corny, but <laughs> um, last Thursday, um, I was with this Girl Scout troop that I was telling you guys, and a couple of the girls are moving away because uh, their mother found a job at a different state. And uh, it was very powerful to me seeing this group of little girls talk to each other about how they touch each other's lives and how they help. One of them talked about bullying and talked to these two girls that are leaving, saying, I'm very sad that you're leaving because you provided incredible support to me when I was going through this hard time and, you know, like thanking everybody in the table. And these are girls that are eight years old. <laughs> so at the end of this meeting, all the girls and all the leaders, we were all like with the napkins, you know. Like, <laughs> and the funny thing is that in the end, we're like, one of the leaders was like, okay, everybody, let's do it at the same time. 
get the napkins and go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a new Girl Scout salute. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, it's, it's a bunch of different components, you know, like having good friends, having a mentor and a role model. And, um, you know, just looking at how you fit in your environment. I guess, too. I think maybe yeah, two more questions. Hello, this question is for Catherine. Um, I really wanted to know, um, just can, can, can you talk more about your work as a senior policy advisor? Um, what issues come before you and then how do you um, deal with them? Um, <laughs> so back to the glass of wine, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so my job at the State Department, um, so I'm in the Office of Global Women's Issues, which covers the gamut. Um, it, it, so the State Department is organized just as a huge building. It's organized both regionally. There are people who focus on issues in a certain region. It's also organized functionally, so people who deal with a certain issue like trafficking. Um, the Office of Global Women's Issues deals with all of it. So we have people who are working on specific re regions, people who are working on specific issues. I'm a little unusual in that I work really, um, I help my colleagues who are, who are taking all of that and looking externally, but I look internally. So um, I try to help us do our jobs better internally within the department on gender. So whether it's my colleagues who are working on human rights issues, helping them write a better strategy that takes into consideration um, uh, issues for both men and women, whether it's working with our training institute, making sure that um, courses uh, talk equally about uh, issues for women and men, um, integrating some of that work. Um, so it's a, my role is a little, a little unusual, but that hopefully gives you a taste of, of what we do. Hi. Um, I know all of you probably work in a situation where you have to get people to rally together and look at an issue that normally people would look over, especially when it comes to like gender issues. You know, we were talking before about how people only see it as a woman's issue and it's not something that everyone will jump on board with. How do you go about like facing the challenge of getting people to look at an issue, not just to get people to see see that it's affecting all of us, but just getting people to look at it and care more. Because you can be very passionate about an issue and other people are like, oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> and no one's really taking you seriously. How do you go about um, trying to build up motivation, not just in yourself, but in other people as well? Um, well, I call people like Malala who's, we've seen what a, what a force of nature she is, what a, a brave young soul, uh, that she's wind in our sails. And uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, you know, there are a number of, um, Archbishop Tutu, there are a number of people who are out there giving voice to our story and saying, who have a very big stage and addressing it in a very, um, I think, profound and acute way. And I sort of talk about them as wind is wind in our sails. But I'll tell you, I come across people who just ask me why, you know, Anne, why are you working in, in Africa now? Look at your own city and look at the graduation rates in your own city and the poverty in my own city. And I've done a lot of work in my city. Um, and some people are just very much, um, and I've actually written about this a bit, you know, and I don't think our world is like this anymore, but they really see these very defined boundaries. And why would you try to affect change outside of your boundary? Are you abandoning your own backyard? Uh, so I, th I think some of that still exists, um, or at least I bump into it on occasion. But, but I think with this space that I'm working in, actually, there's a lot of energy around it right now, which we can leverage off of. Um, so that really, so the advocacy that's going on out there around this issue is, 
is really helpful. I get concerned that some that people get um, complacent because there is so much advocacy, but the advocacy doesn't always necessarily translate to action on the ground, and that's a big concern of mine it, because it's it's not. Um, the amount of advocacy going on right now is not translating to uh, where it's needed, I would say, on the ground. But that being said, all the advocacy going on is wind in our sails and helps. I would say, too, the, for me, the piece of it is um, having data and evidence to, to fall back on. So the people that are doing research around the world, the NGOs, the stories of the more and more that we can collect, that's what feeds into our advocacy. That makes it solid, makes it real, that we are making a difference and that it's worth paying attention when I bring this issue to you. Um, you know, I can tell, we can have the really superstar stories um, you know, but there are hundreds of Malalas. There are hundreds of this. And if I have the numbers and the facts and I can sit down um, with, you know, an NGO, a government, a private partner and say, here's, here's the full scope of, of the problem and, you know, let's work together for a solution, that's what's going to make a difference. Well said. <laughs> okay. Well, um. I know that I feel very honored and grateful that I have to share in these really unique perspectives on um, how you are all working towards um, gender equality for women and girls. So I want to thank you on behalf of Maxwell Women's Caucus. Um, I want to I know that Cherie's had some closing remarks that she would like to make before everyone leaves. Yes. Ladies, thank you once again on behalf of the Maxwell School and Maxwell Women's Caucus. Um, also, attendees, thank you so much for coming and supporting. These are issues that we don't speak about often enough, and we really appreciate your support and active participation. Um, we also invite you to the next event, which is taking place at 4 p.m. It's entitled Women and Sharia, Legal Strategies for Achieving Justice. And Hawa Ibrahim is going to be speaking at that event. And also, right now, we have refreshments in the back. We have sandwiches, cookies, juice. So please feel free to indulge yourselves. Thank you so much. <laughs>